on to the Valsalva maneuver. We use the Valsalva maneuver really for two reasons. Number one, to assess vagal function, and for that part we look at heart rate, and then we'll also look at it from the aspect of assessing adrenergic function, and for that we look at the blood pressure response. So right now we're talking mostly about the, the heart rate response still. The way we perform the Valsalva maneuver, we start out in a supine position, we uh, hook patients up to EKG and a B2B blood pressure device, and then let them rest. And they've already been resting during the QSART and the deep breathing, so they've already been supine for about half an hour before, before we start, but we give them an additional three minutes or so of quiet rest, and then have them blow into a bugle, a bugle with a little bit of an air leak to make sure the glottis is open, and we have them exhale and, and uh, achieve an expiratory pressure of about 40 millimeters of mercury. And um, there's, there's good studies that show uh, the longer the better. Um, studies have shown that 20 seconds is actually desirable, but many people are not able to do that, so for practical reasons we have standardized it to 15 seconds. Um, we try to do the Vassal maneuver as long as we get two reproducible responses. We usually limit ourselves to four or five because it, it is quite a strain, um, but uh, usually after four uh, attempts you get two reproducible ones that you're happy with. Um, there's a certain, there's certain circumstances when we um, go from a supine to a slightly tilted up position, and we'll demonstrate and talk about that more during the actual demonstration. And uh, what we do is when we look at the Valsalva maneuver in terms of the heart rate response, we look at the highest heart rate during the maneuver and divide that by the lowest response following the maneuver, and that's called the Valsalva ratio. And this is basically how it's derived. Um, really, when you look at the Valsalva maneuver, that heart rate response is the result of baroreflex function because it is triggered by the blood pressure response that precedes it. And therefore, it is very, very important to not only look at the heart rate response, but look at the blood pressure profile at the same time because there's variations to normal and those can influence your heart rate response to the maneuver. So, for example, someone who has a very exaggerated blood pressure fall, for example due to adrenergic failure, may have a normal Valsalva ratio, but it is relatively abnormal considering the huge blood pressure drop that preceded it. On the other hand, you may have a patient that has a response like the one indicated here on the bottom, a so-called flat top or square wave response. There the blood pressure drops not, never below baseline. And so you do not have an adequate stimulus to really increase heart rate. And so that heart rate response, in this case, is actually normal, but in, in many circumstances, that might get blunted, and it looks abnormal when you look at normal values, but really it's uh, not abnormal considering the blood pressure profile. And so you really need both to make an adequate judgment as to what's normal and abnormal. Mm -hmm. Again, there's a number of factors that can affect Valsalva ratio other than um, disease. Age and gender play a role here. And of course, uh, there's other factors. And here's a mechanical force that's inducing the maneuver. So the expiratory pressure is important. Uh, we shoot for 40. Some people can't get to 40 millimeters of mercury. Then we are satisfied with 30, even 20 in some circumstances. If a, a fragile old person or a kid, we usually are not able to get much more than 20, we are fine with that. Once you go below that, it would, becomes a little questionable if you, if you really can assess the response. Um, similarly, the duration. 15 seconds is already a compromise. Going less than 15 seconds, 12 seconds, is, is the absolute minimum I would consider a, an adequate Valsalva maneuver. It, if it's less than that, there may not be enough time for a late phase two to form for, for, for the adrenergic uh, system to kick in, and uh, you may get, uh, re you may read the test as, as abnormal even though it is not. Um, medications, again, very important. Antihypertensives, alpha blockers, beta blockers clearly affect your, your Valsalva maneuver. Again, there's normative values. As you can see, age is a factor, but gender as well. Um, and again, those values are published and are uh, just uh, for your information shown here in that table. 
Again, a normal response on the top. You can see a nice uh, tachycardia forming during the maneuver and then reflex bradycardia following the maneuver. This is a patient with radiation-induced bottle reflex failure. You see a little bit of a mechanically induced uh, bradycardia at first, but otherwise there's not whatsoever cardio acceleration during the maneuver, no bradycardia following the maneuver. It's virtually a uh, Valsalva ratio of zero. Actually, one. One is the lowest. Now, I mentioned that Valsalva ratio really reflects bottle reflex function to some degree. There's a little more sophisticated ways to look at vagal bottle reflex function with the Valsalva maneuver when we obtain it in the lab um, because we can basically relate the changes in, blood, in, in heart rate that occur as a result of changes in blood pressure. And uh, what we do there basically is we literally look at the linear relationship between the heart rate response and the preceding fall in blood pressure. And we can do that both for early phase two, shown here, or for phase four of the Valsalva maneuver and derive that linear relationship which is an index of vagal bottle reflex function. It's a little fancier than just looking at the Valsalva ratio. For the most part, it's sort of supplemental information. We don't use that routinely in clinic, but we have that available uh, for certain cases where it's of interest.